Liz Gilleran. Accessibility for MVPs. Yep, I'm Liz. I'm a UX designer at Data61. I have no real formal training in accessibility. I kind of started picking it up after I had several injuries. Um, some of them are genetically really related and others the doctor just went, eh? I don't know how you did that, but we'll fix it maybe. So um, that left me with a bunch of um, times where I couldn't use a keyboard properly or in the bottom um, sort of three of those photos, um, I got trapped to my desk whilst, you know, my colleague wrote messages on the whiteboard behind me because I couldn't get up. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how I began um, looking into accessibility because there were just several things that happened, such as I couldn't get to work because my station didn't have a lift or anything and it was extremely dangerous being on crutches. I don't know if anyone's gone to Redfern Station in peak hour on crutches. It's quite scary. Um, yeah, so this talk is primarily for designers and developers and those that work with them. It's mainly based on desktop experiences, so I won't cover anything in mobile. It's born from personal experience, a lot of frustration, struggling against time and budget, and because this is my job basically. My job is to get stuff done with limited budgets and highly experimental technology. Easy. Yeah, that We'll figure it out. So um, this is the structure of my talk. I'm going to talk about what an MVP is, why do accessibility for MVPs, and how to do accessibility for MVPs, and new challenges, which I don't exactly have the answer for, but hopefully I'll get them eventually. Let's just begin with what is an MVP. It does not mean most valuable player. Um, it's minimal viable product. It's a little bit old hat. Um, it was coined in the Lean Startup, which is a book by Eric Ries. And it involves testing a risk assumption and primarily sort of relies on fast analytic driven feedback. So it's testing a really risky idea and seeing there's a customer for it. This is a bit of a reaction to the dot-com bust because after the dot-com bust, not many venture capitalists had a lot of money to play with. So it was always about trying to lessen the amount of development time you had to get the most out of it to test if something had a market essentially. So why do an MVP as we talked about? Low startup cost, that is the biggest one. The biggest thing for startups is that they have to pay their employees. Terrible, right? Um, and they can get it to quick customer feedback before if figuring out if no one wants to buy their stuff, they can pivot. So what's the benefit of that? This is probably the most famous example of the most, one of the most famous pivots, I think. So Bourbon was a check-in app that was, I think was inspired by drinking and its founders on a mission said it was a, he was, he said it was a bit terrible because it had feature creep. There were way too many features and he tried to implement way too much. But they had a whole of analytics that said that um, the users were mostly posting photos. So that startup then became, after they threw all of the code out and decided to focus on the photos, it became Instagram. So they focused on just the easy photo sharing and the rest is kind of history. So, I'll just wait for some people to take photos, we're good. Um, so what's the trouble with MVPs? Most really aren't usable as products. They're pretty shallow proofs of concepts. And that can be really problematic because what happens when you're really close to a value proposition and you can't scale because you built something that is faulty, has terrible code and can't really be taken out to market. And that's kind of what we were talking about in the beginning that this might be old hat because the industry knows this too. This is just a section, and I don't think I went past the first, oh, the first page of Google. Um, so we have the MVP is dead, long life to the map, the minimum awesome product. The MVP is dead, long live the MVE. Um, whatever that was, I didn't get the second line, sorry. Um, the MVP is dead, long live the RAT. <laughs> Why you should focus on the riskiest assumption tests and forget about MVPs. So, you know, it's a problematic concept now. But the thing is, what's probably most problematic is that MVPs are, tend to be built on Bootstrap or the Material Design Library because it's free, it's open source, someone's figured out the UI components for you. That was a loud vibration, I'm putting it up there. Um, so, but the thing is, these are author dependent on getting this right. So Bootstrap says that it's um, accessible, but it, you know, it, makes it, a, it makes that caveat too, that this is really dependent on the coder getting the accessibility right in the situation. So for the, for the benefit of this talk, my definition of an MVP is one that's actually going out to a target customer. It's the starting point of an actual product that will be built on. It's not a Facebook page that's collecting likes for a startup that one might one day deliver, you know, 
self-portrait purple taro lattes to your cats, which is not a thing, but if you make it a thing, I expect half. <laughs> I like cats. Did you notice the dress and everything? Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so why do accessibility for MVPs? There's also, it's the right thing, but um, there's many other reasons. So my classic situation at Data61 is that I get a researcher, they've maybe done five years of research into some awesome new technology that's gonna change the world. Maybe it's encryption, maybe it's something else. We don't know quite yet, we haven't quite tested it with humans. They're the unknown element but they're attracting interest. Maybe they've been presenting at conferences for five years about this, and other people are researching in this area, but they wanna take it to market now and have some actual humans use the technology. And there's an early adopter. Maybe they're a corporate, maybe they're a government that's really interested in this technology and they wanna be first, so they're willing to pay us and help us get it to market. So we end up in this kind of um, process. The first step is that we have a tech demo we test does the tech work. Usually this part is formed by an engineer or perhaps a researcher with very little engineering skills and it's just testing where the bare bones programming works. We go to a second step where maybe I or someone else gets involved and we gather some user needs about what our first clients need. And then in the third phase, we go to development on how to build what the clients need into that MVP. And in the fourth and final phase where we start seeing if it works, um, we go into a testing phase where we see if it actually works with people. Ooh. Here's the thing about MVPs though. Being lean preferences people who have been assumed to be the default, particularly by the software industry. I don't think I need to go into that stereotype. We all have it very clearly in our heads. So meeting accessibility standards is often seen as a hindrance and a bit of extra time in development that could otherwise be skipped. Because extra time to startups or even corporations that have put money into something that's really risky is extra money, which is extra investment. That's something that could be dumped really easily in case it doesn't work. But, but, the thing is, if we start seeing people as kind of faceless and as numbers, uh, we kind of lose the point of what's the, why we do accessibility in the first place, because not everyone is the same or has the same universal experience. And here's some data on that. Um, almost one in five Australians will report living with a disability. Um, half of those in the 15 to 64 range are in the workforce, compared with an 83% participation rate without a disability. So that's quite terrible. But also, there are these people um, who have disability needs or impairment needs are going to be in your user base. That's just a fact of life, and you need to cater for them. So this is the thing. I actually think, and Sarah Police and Mira Pancania at a panel um, a month ago it talked about this, where they actually think that the reported disability rate is probably quite low, and I agree, because at this point, the second phase in our, like, you know, trying to get from tech demo to testing, um, we collect, should be collecting data about our users' needs at this point in terms of their accessibility needs. However, but, it's more likely that we collect um, data about their accessibility needs at the very, very end when we've already started to try and do some releases. And it's not just because of Murphy's Law that whatever will go wrong will go wrong. It's because I've had people in user testing who didn't identify as having an accessibility need or a disability and because they just don't consider themselves disabled even though they fit the definition. Once I had several conversations with a client representative who I thought I had actually really good rapport with before they actually revealed a reasonably rare condition. And I'd actually made a interface in a lean way, an agile way that had actually made life difficult for them. Even though they could talk to me, they just didn't really feel comfortable until the critical moment. And why would they? Like, they're just not used to being designed for or having their needs taken seriously, so they just tend not to say anything. Um, so if your MVP is not including accessibility, you're missing out on a huge customer segment that goes without saying. Um, and you might actually produce something that's incredibly unsuitable for valuable or corporate or government clients because this is kind of like the text inclusive, like um, what's the term that was used? Um, inclusivity rider. They put it into contracts that things have to be accessible. So waiting to, your, to see if your product is usable or satisfies accessibility requirements can waste a lot of time. You know, we're all about cutting back on time. If we don't think about it in the beginning, we waste a lot of time anyway. So this brings us to three. How do we do this? How do we do accessibility for MVPs? 
It might look like something you'd be quite scared of, but you have reason to. In short, this is done with difficulty. Ideally, it's baked in. We start from the very beginning because there will probably not be money for calling in an accessibility consultant. So it's gonna to have to be done within a house. And it will probably be using some version of the WCAG 2.0 or 2.1 and you know, some situational awareness to make customizations for your user group. And most likely your team will have to wrestle with what over open source library they chose to work with when the product was just in development. So if it was Bootstrap, you'll have to wrestle with the fact that Bootstrap might not cater to what you need to do. If it was material design, Material design and I have some trauma and issues to work out because <laughs> it's let me down a m number of times. Okay, so, but on using the WCAG 2.0 or 2.1, this is a standard that's most universally recognized. Everyone has it. There's many resources out there to help you with it, which makes it kind of suitable for MVPs. The majority of the guidelines also don't really apply to MVPs because you're less likely to have things like live audio or a whole heap of content because you just don't have it yet. So some of these apply, some of them don't. Government generally accepts WCAG 2.0 and at the, at the AA level, but getting to an A in an MVP makes you better than most products out there already in market that are quite mature. Okay, and the benefits are that also it gives you clear tasks. This is, for example, a screenshot, obviously, with the identifiers removed, of a JIRA board for a project we were working on that needed to meet a certain standard of accessibility in sort of an MVP scenario. Because of the WCAG having very clear defined tasks, it makes it very easy to put these into JIRA and start a conversation with developers if they're a remote or you need comments and report bugs. So for example, the one at the bottom was caught, um, you know, while we were trying to, in, while we were in Sprint, that um, the screen reader was behaving erratically. So it makes it really easy to see what issues there were, how to solve them one time, and then build up that sort of knowledge in your team. And it gives the, the business a clear idea of what to work towards. The disadvantages is that it does not cover all of the accessibility issues that you're likely to encounter. Sometimes it will make demands that are hard to do, deal with without serious development, but it's way easier the second time around that you try to audit your project, and there are many, many tools out there, even though it might seem like a long, winding road like the picture that's up there. However, making adjustments to suit um, accessibility concerns could be used by users you didn't anticipate, such as we've got the Microsoft Inclusive Design Kit here about um, situational awareness. So most of these are extremely common and they're mo very likely to happen to anyone in your user base at some point. And this is the thing about working with clients and their expectations and also working with the confines of something that's minimal and something that's new is that these users might not be on your radar now when you're trying to go lean, when you're trying to just get it out the door and like, you know, get customer feedback, but your client's going to think that you should be having these people on your radar as soon as next week. And they're just going to turn up and be like, you didn't think that one of our staff members could have a new baby and maybe have like, you know, problems typing, like, you know, what are you doing? So this is how we have to try and put this all together, all of these concerns. And I'm sort of gonna go through an example, which is not something I've worked on, but kind of sounds like it is. Um, so yeah, the example. Consider this kind of brief. You're making a pilot, a pilot program for a new delivery service, especially in materials, and we're using it to test an underlying technology. Maybe we're testing encryption, maybe we're testing like the delivery mechanism, but we found a client that has found that this is extremely suitable for their market. The previous developer, who might have been a researcher or someone who's just really new to coding, has used a variant of the material library. Maybe they've gotten it from someone's GitHub, who knows. Um, but the thing is, we're planning to have a government client. Oh no. <laughs> because they, wanna, they want us to consider accessibility and meet a standard in order to satisfy our contract to them. And there's also a limited budget. Great, love this problem. So we're basically at this stage. We've made sure that our technology kind of works and now we need to figure out what the user needs are. So what do our first clients need? You find that they need a shopping cart. Someone forgot to include this. Um, they need an organized catalog that's easy to read and they need a way to get complex receipts because this is specialist tech. And also they need to be able to search and filter many specialized products and you don't have any pictures, which is great because we don't need to think of alt text, but also we need to think of other things. So 
then we figure out their needs. And this is what I tend to do whenever these projects come in and I have to be like, okay, so we got to here, but we need to add all these other things to actually make it you know, usable by people so they can get what's going on, is making a list of all the things that you think could be possibly wrong with implementing those features and making sure that you cover them. Um, so for example, a shopping cart, you need to make that keyboard accessible, so you need to make sure that people can actually close it is one of the things that um, happened, is that if you can't close it from the keyboard, it doesn't meet compliance. Um, an organized catalog, um, having a tab order, having things actually being able to be selected from the keyboard and deselected. Things that s sometimes just don't work in the code libraries that we tend to use. Form elements for a way to get complex receipts, making sure your labels actually match up with the fields. And error prevention to make sure that people actually enter the information that they need to. Searching and filtering any specialized products with no pictures. Making sure you, again, link enables. So things that you can start the ball rolling, but making sure you tick off all those things once you get started. So then we come to the, the third phase. How to build all of that knowledge into the MVP. You need to make a plan. You need to make a plan of what WCAG expects you're going to cover and what is going to change. There are things that are kind of like, I like to think of easy wins. Like if you called into a consultant in and they said, yeah, your contrast ratio is a terrible, you'd just be like, I knew that. Um, so, but then there are things that are not as easy. And I would say that always, if you can in an MVP or you're doing a new lean pose of technology and experiment, try and go for the easy wins because once you try and do more complex things, more things can go wrong, such as link underlines, pretty easy. Custom ARIA, no can go wrong really easily. Sitemaps are easy, are easy enough to implement, but searching with error handling, not so much. Alt text of branding, maybe of logos, quite easy. But if you get complex graphs coming in, possibly from the client, because they're like, I got this great picture for you. He was like, no, we have to figure out a whole heap of content to like put that in, and it's not necessarily critical to a product. And also contrast. Contrast colors are just a baseline thing that people should get correct. But things such as the material design, if you try to start changing things, like in the library that they were using, start like, you know, pushing out random animations, quite hard to deal with. So you need to think um, how, sorry, how much time is going to this, how many sprints, and also who is responsible for what. I actually have my own document for this. It's based off the WebMade checklist, and I will let you download it. I'll probably hit up my Twitter tomorrow, and I'll let you download it. Um, just because I don't have it in an accessible format. Terrible. <laughs> but um, I actually mapped this out for my teams because there are things that as a designer or developer, you just can't take all of it in. It's, it's a lot to do within like, you know, maybe a few sprints. So things like I think that business should take care of, such as descriptive text transcripts. Like designers are not meant to be writing those kinds of things. If it's the person who authored that kind of content can do it, they should do it. Um, and also other things that should be checked every sprint. Um, clients of mine, their favorites are to add like great pitches in from their latest event, like you know, suggest those things, but maybe they enter with no alt text. So suddenly your beautiful accessible MVP is now no longer accessible because someone's like, oh, I'll just put a sticker picture in and I won't even think about it. No, um, so, but this is the major ones I should say. Check for new content every sprint. No thing that should be provided before development. These are the major ones. Complex image, alt text, or long text. Color not used as a sole method of conveying content, links, or visual elements. And page functionality being uh, available from the keyboard because that can be broken really quickly. Um, and you need to explain to the client why cosmetic changes are happening. So you need to explain why Things such as you know using really low contrast ratios and not really being explicit about things, why that's a problem. Because they're probably gonna look at that and be like, I don't like that green. And you're just like, they're like, I prefer the blue. And you're just like, no one can read. <laughs> so that's making sure there's a clear timeline of changes. And if you wanna get your camera out, I think this is the one to take a picture of. Start with the most emotionally charged for the client. Branding changes and changing colors for contrast is the most emotionally charged you will probably get because someone will get pushback from higher up saying like, oh, you're not um, complying with our branding, even though graphic designers tend to not make branding with accessibility in mind. So you just be like, I need to make this a fraction darker. Usually works fine, but it's the one that they get a little bit like, oh, it's changed. I'm not sure how I can deal with that. 
But medium is usually things they get excited about, such as new features like, wow, look, this works now, and I can use it, and my grandma can use it, and everyone I know can use it. It's great. Least emotionally charged, new buttons, underline links. Iconography. By that point, if you change the first two, by the time it comes to the third, they'll probably let you, like, you know, continue doing what you're doing because they're pretty pleased with the work. But yeah, make time for feedback and testing, and ask yourself if there's easier ways to do things. Um, my biggest bugbear is that in material design, I'm just sorry if anyone's from Google, but material design has driven me mad. Um, <laughs> hamburger menus play havoc with um, voiceover readers, particularly if they're bad implementations, because you often end up with that drawer sliding in and out really quickly. And also, someone's nodding. Um, also, you end up with the screen reader not knowing what to read. So making navigation simpler, the better, is one of the biggest things. Um, just because if you've got an MVP or a new product, you probably don't have that much content. Make the navigation simple. I like to steal ideas from the target website, particularly because it has it all laid out really quite easily with less animation than you need. Um, OK, and testing. Automatic tests catch the easy wins. So make sure you keep on doing that. Test for things like alt text. The wave tool, the axe tool are great free tools that you can keep doing to catch things that may have left you unawares. Recording who has accessibility needs with your client is the most important, because if they've got people that work with them that have needs, they have a direct relationship with you, they have a direct relationship with the product, and they can tell you what's going wrong better than if you get random or perhaps recruited testing. Just don't be scared of any accessibility feedback. Um, most of it I've gotten is always university kindly meant, because they're just like, I just really want you to succeed. I'm like, well, thank you. Um, but making sure that you're there to be that mechanism for feedback is important. So one of the things that I never got was like, you know, I had a user that was quite photosensitive. And, you know, the color on the left, which is a blue, um, it says I'm a data tag, which I use for a data set, that was too bright for a photosensitive user. But as you can see in my contrast analyzer, it passed with flying colors. But it was actually like kind of hurting their eyes to look at it. And as a designer, I don't like to hurt people's eyes when they look at my designs. It makes me feel a little bit deflated. So you need to be there for that. OK, and coming back to the final part. So sad. Um, new challenges. These are things I haven't solved yet. These are things that are being solved. I hope are solved in the future. I hope some of you feel inspired to solve them, because I have very little time. But challenges, kind of like this stack of mugs with um, coffee being poured on top. These things are really challenging. Um, there are things I just don't have easy solves for at the moment. Data tables are the number one thing, because this is a pretty simple data table. But as you can see, there are things that we just don't predict for. And if you hear this out on a, a screen reader, like you know, it's hard to give people context when someone's just giving you junk data. And if we keep on releasing things like you know, data on websites or making more complex data sets available, making a more data-centric world, essentially. If we have like values, like you know, having hashtags end up in the middle of nowhere in a set, in a set of numbers, or just data that you didn't expect, it really ruins the user experience for these things. And this is a, this is a data set of like four values. Imagine if this was 10,000 records long. Um, data visualization is another one, ironically, because I do a PhD in data visualization. But um, there are things that we're doing at the moment that help, but they're not exactly all the way yet there yet, such as Color Brewer, which makes color um, blind safe data sets colors, and also using patterns on graphs. That's as far as we can kind of go, but it's very limited, and we're creating more complex graphs all the time. Um, maps. <laughs> maps are the worst. <laughs> there are people who are making more things that are good with maps, but as you can see, like with this map here, there are so many pins on it. My goodness. Um, if you're using a screen reader, or even if you've got um, some other like accessibility issue, like keyboard tabbing, that's a lot of things to go through. People are making solutions for this. This is one of my favorite examples, because I've been wanting this for a long time. Um, someone actually clustered the points. Beautiful, beautiful solution. Um, so you can actually you know, drill down into the points as, from the keyboard. But one last point I want to make um, before kind of we come to the end is another thing you should think about that hasn't got really easy solves is ethics. It's a hot topic right now. Um, embrace, if you're doing an experimental project or an MVP, embrace minimal harm, essentially. Are you taking data you shouldn't? Do you need highly personal data from someone? 
If you don't, don't take it. Do you have secure data st storage? These are all things that I think should be part of accessibility, but probably aren't explicitly spelled out in the WCAG, but you should keep them in mind, such as informed consent. I've worked on a couple of projects with children, and you have to really think about those things, about when we take their data, is their parent giving informed consent, and when we collect data from the child, are we doing it in a way that is sensitive, particularly around if they've got an illness and other really vulnerable positions. But please keep trying. Even if you make some easy fixes to date your website, you're probably doing mo better than most things online. It's not easy, but it's worth doing. Clients love getting the stuff fixed because I've had, I work a lot with the public service and there's a lot of people in the public service that kind of use their grads, I think as their tech support because I've just seen like grads behind there being like, no, the menu's there, the menu's there. When people get the satisfaction of, particularly if they're older users that maybe can't see things so well or there's contrast issues going on, they really love using your product if they can actually see it, for one thing, and if they can actually interact with it. And they love getting that stuff fixed, and the person who's your uh, sort of like sponsoring client loves getting that fixed because he or, he or she or they have um, employees that really respond well to that and love using your product. They will come back for more if you try to fix things or if you fix things and try. Sorry. Um, just work an accessibility concept, consultant, probably into your beta budget, and um, just keep trying. Thank you. You can find me at this address. My name is Aravind. So the, my question is related to the WCAG guidelines uh, upload into the JIRA. So there are a lot of ways in which one could interpret those guidelines. So do you think that uh, we could rely on that alone or should we refine those guidelines further? I'm not quite sure what the question is. Are you talking about refining the guidelines yourself or? Uh, no, sort of uh, giving something specific to the UI which you are going to use like uh, for the MVP, if suppose we are selling mobiles and we are building a shopping cart for mobiles. Should we give specific instructions in those uh, JIRA requirements or it, it's, is it just a WCAG guidelines enough? Hmm? Oh, Wait, you have another, because I think Amir might be able to give you a, a I can, answer. Uh, I can answer that. I think the question is, is keeping the generic guidelines as a way for your developers and designers to um, adhere to, or should they be specific? So in our talk, we talk about being specific. So if you have a button that's got a label, in your acceptance criteria, spell out the label and followed by the button, as opposed to saying, adhere to guideline 2.3.1, where every button needs to be announced. So this ensures that things don't fall, the cracks, uh, fall through the cracks and, and developers and designers start assuming something. So my answer would be to be as explicit as possible, taking those guidelines as, a, as they are. Yeah. Amir, thank you. You just made Liz's job. I hope that answers your question. Everyone, uh, another round of applause for Liz. Thank you very much, Liz. Alley Camp, October 2018.